Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tawny Samiski. I'm an entomology specialist here at UMass Extension, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's uh, invasive insect webinar. This is part of a series that is born from a collaboration between our landscape, nursery, and urban forestry program and our uh, fruit program here at UMass Extension. And thank you to those of you who are joining us today for the first time, as well as those of you who are coming back again uh, for another webinar in this series. These presentations are made freely available to you uh, through grant funding from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and their Specialty Crop Block Grant Program. So we thank them for that support. I also have here with me today uh, Jeffrey Jouet, who is assisting with the technical aspects of running our webinar. And Jeffrey, I'll ask you to proceed to the next slide. So just a little bit of information about pesticide and association credits for those of you joining us today who are in search of those. Um, all instructions for receiving pesticide credit, which includes the Massachusetts categories 26, 27, 29, 35, 36, and applicator's license or core license, as well as association credits will be shared at the end of today's webinar. So please remain on the webinar until the very end to receive these instructions, as well as to take the quiz for pesticide credit. So the quiz is only required for those of you who are looking for pesticide credit. If you sign off the webinar but before taking the quiz, unfortunately, you will not be allowed to retake it and will not be awarded the pesticide credit. So again, uh, please stay with us throughout the duration of today's broadcast. Another um, item that is new to today's webinar that I want to mention so that folks don't get confused, um, we are going to try to use GoToWebinar's polling system in order to get some audience feedback um, to some questions that one of our speakers will be uh, asking today. So. Uh, the poll is for our speaker's information only. It is not the, the quiz uh, for your pesticide credit. So that, again, that uh, quiz for credit will come at the end of today's broadcast. Um, when the poll does um, come up, uh, we'll let you know. And what will happen is that uh, while the poll is running, you will not see the PowerPoint that our presenter is sharing, but it will come back um, right after the poll has been finished. So don't let that uh, make you nervous that you've lost the presentation either. Um, but I can give more tips once we reach that point in today's presentation. I also want to remind everybody in today's audience uh, that there is a question function in GoToWebinar. So if you're looking to ask some questions, look at your dashboard and drop down the question section and you can type those in and either myself or at the end of the presentation, our two presenters today will um, respond to those questions live. Also beware uh, for those of you using a cell phone uh, to view today's broadcast. Uh, again, when you get to the pesticide uh, quiz portion of today, be careful about using your back button um, as you might get kicked out uh, uh, while taking the quiz then. Um, all right, so I think without further ado, what I will do here is start to switch over to our first speaker and introduce today's presenters. And so first up, um, we have Liz uh, Garofalo from UMass Extension's Fruit Program, who will be followed by uh, Dr. Jaime Pinheiro with the UMass uh, Stockbridge School of Agriculture and UMass Extension Fruit Program. And today they are talking about uh, the invasive pest brown marmorated stink bug in Massachusetts, biology, monitoring, and management. So please take it away, Liz. Thanks, Tony. So before I hand things over to uh, Dr. Pinheiro, I'm gonna talk about brown marmorated stink bug distribution, biology, and monitoring. And so brown marmorated stink bug originates from China, South Korea, and Japan. It's considered a nuisance pest or a nuisance species in its native range, um, but it's and it's a highly polyphagous bug. So what that means is that this guy is not very picky in what it eats. It'll feed on just about any plant. 
Um, it's been recorded feeding on more than 300 of its host plants. Um, it's also an adept traveler, so that enables it to pretty much hitch a ride on a car and a suitcase in a shipping freight container and um, get anywhere around the world, which is how it has gotten to places like Europe where it has established a population. Um, the first time that was noticed was in 2007 in Zurich, Switzerland. It's also managed to find its way to Santiago, Chile. Uh, that was discovered in 2017. And of course, it's established its population here in the um, in North America, and that actually happened in Allentown, PA, in the mid '90s was when that insect was first seen. But it was identified in about 2001. So they first found it in the mid '90s. It was positively ID'd in 2001. Flash forward to uh, 2010, and the Mid-Atlantic is getting hammered with um, damage from this insect. And when I say hammered, what I mean is $37 million crop loss in apples and a complete loss in peaches. So since then, it has spread throughout the contiguous states, nearly all of the contiguous states of the U.S., as well as up into Canada. It's also been found in Alaska and in Hawaii. Um, as you can see here, this map is showing you that spread. Clearly where it's red is where the greatest damage has been caused. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic, of course, is, was the uh, epicenter of this invasion. Uh, moving further out from that, we're having agricultural and nuisance problems in that orange, in those orange states. Um, and then in the yellow states, it's just the nuisance problems, which means, as I'm sure many of you have seen, it's getting into our houses, it's setting up shop there, and nobody really likes to see this particular insect, let alone large numbers of them in their home. So in Massachusetts, we've been trapping since 2012. Uh, UMass Extension scientists have been collaborating with uh, Massachusetts Department of Agriculture, with private consultants. And so we're, we've worked together to set up a, a wide trapping ne network throughout the state. Um, at one point, there were 15 sites across the state. And we've had hit or miss um, catches at some of those sites, but what we've really seen is this concentration of population here in the center part of the state. Uh, as you can see, there's a number of roads that kind of converge here. So like I said before, brown marmorated stink bug is a great traveler. So if it's hitched its right way from New York State, for example, coming in on 90, coming down from Vermont, New Hampshire, and especially coming up through Connecticut, which has high populations and significant agricultural damage. And that all sort of converges in this area. So we have orchards and farms that we've been trapping at here, and this is the area where we also saw our first um, our first catches that were exceeding threshold. So over the years, like I said, we've been trapping, and so in 2016 and 17, again, we were seeing some small numbers, but nothing that was really um, concerning in terms of agricultural damage. 2018 was that first year that we saw our traps exceed thresholds and the only crop that we currently have a threshold for is apples. So we exceeded that threshold which is 10 per trap in a week. So when we saw that happen what we did was we deployed a new trap and that's why you see this really big spike in our numbers that new trap is very good at catching insects or these stink bugs. So then 2018 and then 2019, we also had these traps up. So big numbers in those two years. Um, but you see, obviously, there's this sort of time frame in which these insects are really getting caught in our traps. That's when they're feeding heavily and they're getting ready to move into their overwintering sites. So about the bug itself. So first of all, it is a real bug, unlike a ladybug, which is actually properly a beetle. Um, so these bugs, they um, they have similar, some traits that they share. So Pearson sucking mouth parts, for example, um, and then incomplete metamorphosis, which that what that means is that they're young, the juvenile forms somewhat resemble the adult forms, whereas with a lady beetle, the juvenile form is that larvae that you see feeding on aphids, which is completely different than what the adult beetle looks like. Um, and within that order, there's the family is actually shield and stink bugs. So there's a large family of these insects that are similar, 
um, and possess similar traits, which we'll go over right now. So one of the ways that you distinguish brown marmorated stink bug from other stink bugs or other shield bugs um, are some of these traits here. So first of all, you can look at its shoulder where this blue circle is here, it's rounded. Across the back of its shoulders, you'll often see little dots. But one of the most distinct characteristics that brown marmorated stink bug has are these um, alternating bands on its antennae and on its legs. On its legs, it's especially apparent on the juvenile forms where it's very distinctly black and white. So the shield bugs, some of the traits that they share as well are these, these hardened forewings. There are two sets of wings. So these hardened forewings cover over their membranous back wings when they're at rest. So they don't tent up like others do. They, they lay flat, as you see here. Uh, the nymphs, when they first emerge, are very brightly colored orange and black. And then they go through five instars before they reach an adult form. This adult here on the left is the male, and the female is slightly larger. So it's important to be able to distinguish brown marmorated stink bug from other stink bugs for a number of reasons, uh, not least of which is some of them, like this spine soldier bug, are predatory insects. So this spine soldier bug is a good guy. You want to see this one around. So I mentioned the, um, the rounded shoulders on the brown marmorated stink bug before. As you can see here, the spine soldier bug has a very, very distinctly pointed shoulder region. Also, their eggs are this black pearl color with little um, spines coming off them as well. So as I mentioned with brown marmorated, the antennae are one of the um, distinguishing characteristics. And here with this spine soldier bug, there are no real obvious delineations between the coloring. They're still segmented, but there's not a real obvious change in light to dark color. Uh, likewise, the legs do not have that marking on them. In the center here, you see a rough stink bug nymph, which looks similar to the brown marmorated stink bug nymphs, except that it's a very dusty color as compared to the very striking um, contrasting colors that you see on the BMSB. The other thing that you can see here is these red markings that the BMSB does not have on its legs. And then again, on the right, you see the uh, brown stink bug, which is a native, and slightly pointed shoulders, those antennae are not uh, stripes the way the brown marmorated are, nor are the legs. Their legs are a little bit more spotted. And again, the nymphs do look different from species to species. This here on the left is that spine soldier bug. And then on the right again, you see the uh, brown marmorated. And you can see the eggs are different again. You see the black pearl with the spines on them on the left. And the brown marmorated are sort of a pale white and it's often even like a pale green. Understanding the difference between these is important because if you have to manage for brown marmorated stink bug, you, you need to know, first of all, that that's what it is that you're dealing with. Because if you have a beneficial insect, for example, the spine soldier bug, you're not gonna wanna eradicate it the way you want to a brown marmorated stink bug. Also, those spine soldier bugs are less likely to invade homes or and they do not cause damage in crops. So brown marmorated stink bug overwinters in as adults. Again, this is where you see them coming into the homes. This is where this insect originally came into everybody's consciousness because they saw them coming in, and especially in the mid-Atlantic in huge numbers. Um, a couple of years ago, there was an article in the New Yorker uh, where a family woke up to find thousands of them had invaded their bedroom, which is a horror story I hope to never personally have to experience. So the overwinter is the adults, and in the spring they leave their home, they leave those sites go out lay eggs and start to feed generally out in the wild spaces out in the forested areas uh, once they have exhausted those food stores out in the wild spaces they tend to move into cropping systems they have one to two generations per year depending on how long uh, the warm weather will last in a season the adults the adult form lasts for about 45 days they lay their eggs and then they go through their five instars that we mentioned before. The really big challenge with this for us up here in the north is that they uh, they like to feed on the same things that we like to eat. For example, apples and peaches and pears and peppers and anything that you can think of as far as crops go. Brown marmorated stink bug is not picky. It will eat anything. Um, 
They also are able to feed on ornamental crops. So they can feed on trees by piercing the bark and feeding through the vascular tissue there. So not only do they cause issues with fruits, but they also cause issues with ornamental crops. So I mentioned that piercing sucking mouth part, here you can see a nymph feeding on a crab apple. It's got that proboscis jammed right into that fruit there. And so what it's doing is it's sucking the juices out from underneath the skin. And what happens is that the tissue underneath then sort of collapses and it turns this corky brown color. Um, obviously with crab apples, that's not so much of an issue, but if you're trying to sell your fruit or your vegetables, that makes the your your crops completely unmarketable. Uh, here on the right hand side, you see this pink lady apple that has been covered in stink bug damage, and at the bottom you can see that subsequent damage inside of the fruit as well. Again, it's brown and corky, and it's very unappealing. So, in order to successfully implement any integrated pest management programming. You have to be able to identify your target pest, which we've just gone over, so now you can successfully do that. You've got to be able to recognize that feeding damage because that will let you know that you're actually experiencing uh, crop loss. So again, now you're able to do that. Um, so the next part of this, though, is this monitoring. If you know what is there and what level of population that you're at, then you can make better um, decisions in terms of which, how you're gonna manage. But there are different ways that you can monitor this insect. Um, first of all, what we use is an aggregation pheromone. Uh, and it really is basically the equivalent of a tailgater. You know, you set out your hibachi grill and you get it going and people smell it and start to come over to see what's going on. Brown marmorated stink bug does a similar thing in that it emits a feeding aggregation pheromone. And so, one stink bug will admit that pheromone, another will come over, and then that one will start to admit that pheromone, and so on and so forth, until you get this huge mass uh, of, that you see here on the screen. Thankfully, we haven't seen this in Massachusetts. This picture was taken in California. But this gives you a sense of just how powerful that aggregation pheromone can be. So we don't usually just throw that pheromone out into the wild. Uh, what we do is we put it into traps. These traps, there are different types of traps that we use. This one that you see here is the one, the gold standard. This is the one that our, um, our thresholds were set with. It's generally, it was first created with a black plywood. It was meant to mimic the tree. And so what happens is the brown marmor and stink bug smells the aggregation pheromone and climbs up this these uh, flanges here into this canister. And inside of this canister is where we have our aggregation pheromone and a kill strip. Because if they don't die in the canister, they'll just crawl right back out and we won't know whether they're there in the orchard or not. Um, so there are some challenges associated with this particular trap. Um, first of all, the kill strip itself is not that great to handle. Um, and then there's general maintenance of it. Spider webs get in there, you need to clean them out. You have to clean the, um, the weeds out from around the base of the trap. Uh, and there's also what I happen, what I like to call tractor blight. Somehow this particular trap seems to blend into the landscape. And so that when people are mowing or doing other um, farm related tasks, they don't see it and they do hit it with a tractor, which of course renders it completely useless. Um, the other traps that we have available to us are these two of these here. So on the right, you see this rocket trap. The rocket trap is generally installed in the canopy itself. The flanges here are attached to the branches, again, intending to be a mimic of the tree itself, drawing the stink bug up into the canister where it's trapped. The nice thing about this one is there's no kill strip. Um, but it hasn't really been as effective in trapping the insects themselves. Uh, and on the left here, you see this new, uh, what we're calling a sticky panel. It's just a sheet of plastic covered in sticky um, sticky substance. You still use the aggregation pheromone, but you don't have to go through the, uh, the process of cleaning out the traps or any of that. This is much easier to deal with, which is why people have been really interested in, in showing some good success in using this as a trapping method.
So the other trap that we have started to use, and I mentioned this before when I told you about our increased trap captures, this is the ghost trap. Uh, so they originally started calling it that because it was hanging from a, um, a pole and it would blow in the breeze and it looked very otherworldly. So what this is, is it's netting that has been impregnated with pyrethrin. And then we set it up over a stake, pin it down so it doesn't blow away, as you can see with the rocks down below, and then add the pheromone into that. So the pheromone, unlike with the other, the rocket trap and the pyramid trap, the pheromone is not contained inside anything. And so what's happening is we're drawing these stink bugs in at a greater rate. Um, and they're good flyers. They can go up to 70 miles a day. So what they do, they're drawn into this, this net and as soon as they land on the net, they come into contact with that insecticide. And then they die and they fall to the bottom and we're able to count them that way. And that is all I have for the biology and monitoring of brown marmor and stink bug. I'm gonna now hand things over to Dr. Jaime Pinheiro to talk about management. Thank you, Liz. Um, did you share with me? So, um, can you hear me, Liz? Yes. Liz? yes I can. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Liz, for covering the distribution and uh, biology and monitoring options for the brown marmorate sting bug. So, I focus on four topics that relate to management. The first one is going to be attract and kill strategies. Second one is trap cropping. Then I will discuss uh, insecticide options and biological control. So attract and kill systems influence insect behavior mostly through the olfactory system, that means via smell. And there are multi multiple modalities of attract and kill uh, systems. Examples include bait stations, um, mass trapping systems, protein bait sprays for uh, fruit flies, and trap cropping. And key to the success of these uh, strategies is the use of powerful attractants in the form of pheromones, aggregation of or sex pheromones, and plant volatiles. Sometimes you can incorporate the visual cues, uh, for example, yellow color or red color for the uh, apple mouth or spotted wind drosophila, but this is what the attract and kill systems are. So for the brown marmorated and uh, sting bug, some attract and kill systems have been uh, investigated recently. And this is based on the tendency of these insects to stay on perimeter uh, row trees. So the concept of attract and kill uh, involves, again, deploying the pheromone for this particular insect on the trees and then spraying insecticides only to those dated trees only. This will be very similar to what we have done before with plum curculio, where you can bait the trees with the pheromone and plum volatile, and you can spray just those trees. So in the picture, you can see how um, from research done in, in West Virginia and in the Mid-Atlantic, so pheromone lures were deployed on perimeter row trees. Then again, those trees are sprayed. I think they were also spraying adjacent trees uh, to minimize the spillover effect. And this research that I will explain in a moment, it has been done by Dr. Uh, Rob Morrison and Dr. Tracy Lesky and her group. So this is a, this is a recent, recent paper published in, in a journal called Pest Management Science. Um, they did the research for two years in 10 commercial farms in five different states that include Pennsylvania and West Virginia. And again, those trees uh, that they baited with the pheromone, um, they were sprayed. And they use a very high dose of pheromone. So from June to fruit harvest, which it depends on the cultivar, it was uh, September to October, growers spread insecticides weekly to those pheromone baited trees. So it's not based on economic thresholds, it just uh, weekly sprays to those trees compared to blocks where the growers manage the, uh, the invasive species um, um, using their own uh, methods. So here are the results. What you see on the right is a chart and showing the proportion of fruit that I sampled that has injury by the BMSB. So on the left is the year 2015, on the right is the year 2016, 
the top two panels show early season injury. The middle panels show mid season injury. And then what happens at harvest is shown in, at the bottom. So what you see in the blue boxes is just to highlight some of the results. But basically, they found two to seven times less damage by BMSB in the attract and kill blocks compared to the global control. That was depending on the year um, and also whether it was early or uh, mid or late season. So coming back to the boxes, you can see on the left in 2015, number one, there is more injury, significantly more injury in the perimeter row trees in the global standard blocks compared to the attract and kill blocks. There was no difference in the interior trees. On the right, um, you can see the blue box, similar results in 2016, except that in the interior, there was significantly more injury in the interior, in the global control uh, blocks compared to the attract and kill block. And then at harvest, there was no difference in perimeter row uh, injury, but there was significantly higher injury in the interior trees in 2015 when you have the global control blocks. Similar results were in, in, found in 2016, but the difference was not significant. So in general, the attract and kill uh, approach works well. You spray uh, only those trees that are baited. But also as an anecdote, mm -hmm. um, they say that over two years, they were able to kill over 10,000 uh, BMSB uh, adults and nymphs on those trees that were baited with the pheromone. And then by using um, the trap, at, um, I would call it trap tree approach, uh, they were able to reduce insecticide use by 97% in these studies. So one constraint, however, is that they use a very high amount of pheromone, and that was pretty expensive. It was perhaps more than $1,000 per, per block. Uh, I'm not sure about the cost, but it was very high. So they are still working on refining the technique by improving the pheromone and the strategy so that this can become a more cost-effective uh, option for growers. So um, Liz already mentioned the ghost trap. This is a very good monitoring option for um, these invasive species. I would also say that it can also help kill some of the adults at harvest when you are having less options to spray and when it's very close to harvest. So the story behind this uh, uh, ghost trap is that in 2014, one grower from Pennsylvania took a piece of horticultural net, treated with the insecticide, and then baited the net with the, the pheromone lure. He put the trap out in the orchard. He wanted to see what would happen. And then he got the support from the, uh, the entomologist Greg in Crosswick from Penn State Extension. And they were able to record uh, that on, a, on average, about 400 uh, BMSB uh, adults and nymphs were killed every week. So here are the results again from the work that was done in 2017, the ghost trap in Pennsylvania, the highest numbers similar in Massachusetts, they take place in late August and September. But coming back to Massachusetts, well, in 2018, as Liz already said, we experienced the highest populations um, in some areas of the state. So we decided to implement this uh, monitoring tool and compare against the small pyramid traps. And this was much more effective for monitoring purposes. I would like to highlight that if you want to buy the netting, the registration is only for monitoring. So if you want to use this uh, ghost trap uh, in your orchard, I would recommend it. Just make sure you count sometimes those insects to be able to say that you are monitoring for the pest. And um, so we deployed uh, five uh, um, ghost traps in five different locations. We didn't get many. It's combining the five orchards, it was 245 uh, BMSB adults and nymphs in a five-week period. But however, as you know, they will be feeding a lot. So just by removing also some of those individuals from the population, you may be less likely to spray, but maybe you have to. I mean, again, that's based on monitoring and damage that you can record in your place. So this is where you can buy the, the pheromone and the there are multiple uh, vendors. And there is only one place, I think, where you can buy the insecticide treated netting. So the information is right there. So let's go to the um, second topic, which is trap cropping. Yeah, I would like to spend some minutes in, in this uh, regard because 
trap cropping is based on the preference of insects for some crops over others. So trap cropping represents a, a pest management option for this insect, including, I would say, for organic growers. So there has been some research done in, in the last 10 years um, which focus on the BMSB, but there is also research done before, 20 years ago, 15 years ago in Florida, other states, showing in summary that sunflower, sorghum, um, per millet, buckwheat, those are very good uh, trap crop plants for a uh, BMSB. So we decided to uh, conduct a very small demonstration study in Belcher Town at the Yuma's Cold Spring Orchard. So here we're now, uh, um, we divided the plots uh, in multiple subplots. Sub so we have uh, one area that has dwarf sunflower, a different area that has buckwheat, per millet, and sorghum. So the, the question is, can we bring the brown marmorated uh, sting bug away from trees into this area by also combining the trap crop plants with the pheromone? So we have the trap crops in the absence of pheromone, in the presence of pheromone, and then we also have the pheromone alone. So if we have a good and uh, interesting results, we can do this bigger uh, next year. We just work uh, having a lot of challenges uh, this year for this work. So this picture was taken um, yesterday. You can see the buckwheat uh, growing, the sorghum uh, still very small. So in about three weeks, you're going to have the buckwheat uh, in bloom. And then we're going to start monitoring for the brown marmorated sting bug uh, in those locations using uh, the clear sticky cards uh, with, uh, with and without uh, the pheromone. So now I would like to discuss insecticides. So for many insect pests, the decision of whether to spray or not, it needs to be based on economic thresholds. And this is basically the density of the insect that is going to trigger a control method. Usually it's going to be insecticides. So just to recap recapitulate what uh, Liz already said, so if you are using a pyramid trap baited with the pheromone, then the economic threshold is 10. As soon as you accumulate 10 uh, nymphs and uh, adults, you can spray the border or you can spray the, the orchard. It depends on where you have your trap and also based on injury. So um, this threshold was developed uh, by Tracy Lesky and her group. And then once you spray an insecticide, the threshold is reset and you start counting again uh, until you accumulate 10. More recently, with the clear sticky uh, trap or board that Liz uh, described, well, there is some discrepancy. Some people say you, the thresholds could be four. Some people will say, well, it's 10. So what I want to say is that the economic threshold continues to be refined for this uh, specific trap. Now, when it comes to insecticides, the options are basically to use those insecticides in the parithroid, neonicotinoid, and carbamate in chemical classes, those will be the most effective options. Not even the organophosphates can be considered to be very effective in, at killing the brown marmot uh, BMSB, and that is because it's very hard to kill these insects. So if you decide to use parithroid insecticides, there's some examples in the parentheses, just keep in mind that those are, going, are likely to kill uh, predatory mites that are going to feed on the European red mite and the, on the two-spotted spider mites, and that could trigger outbreaks of these uh, spider mites. So in general, I consider parietal insecticides to be a poor fit to IPM programs when it comes to BMSB because of those negative impacts on predators and uh, beneficial arthropods. So I would say consider using parietal insecticides only if the potential for injury by the BMSB is, is very high. So this table is coming from the 2020 New England Tree Fruit Management Guide. You can see the most um, recommended materials are in these categories, uh, parithroids and neonicotinoids. There is some mixes. There is um, an insecticide called Verdeprim, it's at the bottom, and that's in the IRAC group 28. And it has translaminar activity, it can also be considered to be systemic. It's a new registration for fruit crops. It has long residual activity and broad spectrum control. So it seems that this may be an option also for a BMSB, but I don't think there has been a lot of research showing 
how effective it is against NBFSB. If you are growing the crops in a, using organic um, um, programs, well, there are not so many options. Um, I think you'll know about that. The best option is basically Paiganic at the highest rate, label rate. In some research done um, in West Virginia, they show that when you combine Paiganic with surround, which is called in clay, you are more likely to control uh, or to kill the MSV compared to either material alone. In particular, Paganic, because surround is not really toxic. But the combination seems to be working better than Paganic alone. So then there is this other material, which um, it, 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 I think was registered about six, seven years ago. It's called Acera insecticide. This insecticide is expected to have better activity against BMSB. It's not going to be super effective, but at least combines um, Paganic with the asadiractin, which is uh, in the neem seed. So I have tested this before against Japanese beetles. It's going to kill the adults that are in contact with insecticide. But in that particular case, again, in organic systems, those Japanese beetles that are coming, coming back to the, or coming to the, or penetrating into the orchard and the next day, they're not going to die. So it's just basically what is going to uh, be in touch or in contact with this insecticide, but nothing happens in, in one day or two days after that. So you have to spray multiple times if you have a high BMSB pressure. So the label has um, a list of more than 100 insects that includes, again, Japanese beetles, includes uh, spotted wind drosophila and the BMSB. So it's a consideration for organic growers because, again, there are not so many options. So one important consideration when choosing insecticides, in addition to how effective this is going to be against the insect pest, the target, is the rainfast properties. So some materials are more likely to wash off with rainfall than others. So the information I will present in the next slide comes from Michigan State University, Dr. John Wise. He has been doing a lot of work in this area. So this table shows the expected rain fastness of different insecticides, different chemical classes. On the left, you can see organophosphates, parithroids going down to abermectins. And, and depending on how much rainfall it falls on the fruit and the leaves, you can see the, how, how rain fasting this material is. So if you get no rainfall or less than half an inch, the best materials are the new nicotinoids or the oxidiacins. Basically, there is no difference with parithroids. Those will be the most um, the chemicals that have the best uh, rain fasting properties. Diamides also high in uh, rain fast properties. If you get uh, one inch of rain on the fruit, then the options start uh, diluting. So you have the diamides uh, still showing high activity, high residue on the fruit. Uh, less on the leaves. When you get up to two inches of rainfall, then or organophosphates and parithroids are really going to have very, very low rain fasting properties. So in those cases, you are going to have um, more than 70% of the residue um, um, disappearing. So now we have a one minute poll, and with this, uh, I would like to ask uh, Tony for some help. So it's just basically to get some information from you in, in just one minute. Yes, certainly. I can initiate the first question. And just a reminder to everyone that um, the PowerPoint will disappear while you are receiving the poll question. Also, if you have trouble answering the poll, we found that sometimes if you exit out of full screen on your computer that you are able to answer. So let's give this a try and I will send everyone the first question.
Thank you to everybody answering. I see we've got about 70 to almost 80% of folks responding. I'll give everybody a couple more seconds and we'll start question two. All right, so we're hovering around 82% of folks responding to this one. So I am going to initiate the second question. Thank you to those who answered. All right, hovering again around 81 or 82 percent of folks. So I will close this one and we will uh, answer the last question in the poll. All right, we seem to be hovering around only 63% of folks uh, voting on this one. So a couple more seconds and then we will end the poll and can get back to Dr. Pinheiro's presentation. All right, great. Thank you everybody for participating. Thank you, Tony. And so can you see again the presentation? Yes, you're all set. Okay, thank you. So the last four slides um, are for um, a discussion on biological control. Um, I think there is good uh, news in the horizon for the management of these uh, invasive species using biological control. So basically, uh, entomologists were searching for uh, um, natural enemies of these invasive species in the native range, which is China, etc. So they got some uh, specimens in quarantine, but eventually they found this wasp on their own. So nobody brought it in, but it was um, on purpose, I mean, uh, with scientific purposes. So around 2015, it was found, and it's currently found in 12 different states. So this is called the samurai wasp, and what you can see is already present in the west and also in the east coast. Um, the first time it was found, it was 2014, and it goes to 2019, uh, which I think is Utah. So again, this is uh, good news. I have a very short video to show you. I have to decrease the volume because otherwise it's going to show some music, or I mean, you will listen to music. So basically, I want to show you the life cycle, uh, part of the life cycle, which is the emergence of the adult samurai wasp from the eggs of the Brahman monitored steam bog. So just about 45 seconds.
So if you have seen the size, on, if you have seen the brown marmorated sting bug eggs, you can imagine the size of this wasp. Seems to be very effective. In China, uh, parasites can reach 50 to 80 percent, and in the native range, the BMSV populations are much lower than here in the U.S. So once you once people find the wasp in a state. I think it's okay to be able to redistribute. So Cornell University has been releasing and also monitoring um, the, the occurrence of this wasp in New York since 2017. And Rutgers University has also been releasing the wasp in New Jersey in two consecutive years. So in Massachusetts, we have not been able to um, monitor for this wasp. If we find it naturally, then we can uh, uh, start uh, efforts to spread uh, the distribution and increase numbers. Each female can lay up to 150 uh, eggs. So that means that uh, you don't mean, it takes time for them to, de to develop. It's always going to be maybe in lower population than the best, but it could help to um, bring this natural enemy in, in higher numbers against the MSB. So that's all what I have to say. If you have any questions to me or to, uh, to Liz, please let us know. And I want to close by just uh, leaving one slide, which is this one. I just want to highlight the newsletters that we have at UMass. One of them is the Healthy Fruit. And you can read about them. Uh, it's a, published, uh, a weekly publication. There is also the Fruit Notes, which is published four times per year. And the Fruit Notes is a grower and friendly uh, journal where we publish the findings from our research. So thank you very much. Excellent. Well, ooh, excuse me. <laughs> thank you so much, Liz, and thank you, Jaime. Uh, excellent presentation. So I have some questions that have come in, and folks, if you have further questions, please enter them into the question section at this time. But from Kathleen, um, do you have to worry about pollinators getting attracted to the pheromone and getting stuck on the sticky traps of the rocket or the pyramid trap? Yes, thank you for your question. And pheromones, insect pheromones, are very specific to those insects that emit the pheromone. So in this particular case, in addition, we're using now the clear sticky card. It has no visual, visual cues. If we're using a yellow card, yes, you will have pollinators coming, not to the pheromone, they will be going to the visual cue, which is yellow color. But in the absence of the color, it's very unlikely that you're going to have um, pollinators or other beneficials responding to the pheromone. Any insect captured um, by the clear sticky card that is not the BMSB, it will be a random capture. capture. Thank you. Thank you. And Liz, did you have anything to add to that? No, Jaime covered that well. Okay, great. Um, the next question comes from Paul. Um, folks af often ask how uh, the brown marmorated stink bug is getting into the house. Um, oh, maybe this is not a question, more of a comment. These people have uh, what they thought was a tight home, but still get stink bugs. Um, so maybe just a comment. Any comments in response to that? Yeah, unless you're living in a biodome that's hermetically sealed, these they can just get in through the smallest of cracks. And honestly, they're so good at hitchhiking. You might think that you have your house hitched all sealed up, but if they, you know, get on your bag or on a box that you're bringing into the house, you got them. All right, thank you. Um Let's see, and it seems like we've uh, lost seeing, or at least I've lost seeing Dr. Pinheiro's screen, um, but we can continue to answer questions without seeing that. Um, from actually related to this, uh, from Brian, what is the method that is best for managing an infestation in a home? Liz, do you want to go? Sure. Um, so, there are a few things that you can do in a home. What you don't want to do is use a pheromone trap in your home. Um, that's going to just draw them in further. What you can do, uh, so there's been research that has shown they're actually drawn to light and they're active at night. So what you can do if you've got some issues in a home is you can set up a, um, 
like a catch bowl, like some water with a little soap in it to break the surface tension with a light over that. And that will draw them into the bowl. It's a little gross, but it drowns them in the water and then you can just chuck them and get rid of them. Um, I, in a, in a place where there's a high infestation, like I was talking about before with the thousands of them in the house, that's not really gonna um, cover it. But what we see here in our area, will, that will help. Um, and in terms of having super high infestation levels, you're going to want to have a de dedicated vacuum canister or bag that you can get rid of. Normally, you would not want to use a vacuum because they do, they, they're called stink bugs because they smell bad. Um, so you don't want to use your regular household vacuum to clean these up. But if you have a high infestation level, you might consider um, getting a vacuum that you would use just to get rid of them and then get rid of the vacuum once you got them gone. Thank you. Um, a question from Kathleen. Do you have to worry about killing feeding pollinators with the use of pyrethroids and neonicotinoids or carbamates? Um, does the brown marmorated stink bug come out after the pollinators are feeding on the blossoms? Um, or do you have to worry about them being active after those treatments? Um, or uh, yeah, after those treatments were made? Yes, right. well, well, what I wanted to say, you want to say something please so, go ahead Jaime well basically the overwinter generation of the BMSB is going to be low so you can expect a few adults in orchards feeding early in the season um, but I don't think it's going to happen that you have to control them using these parithroids that would be more, more late midsummer and late season so in, at that moment you really don't have flowers you don't have pollinators and well, many uh, visiting your um, trees, but you have to be careful because you have, uh, again, uh, natural enemies of other pests, parasitic wasps and uh, predatory insects that eat mites and other insects. Those could be killed or are going to be killed with these uh, parithroids and carbamates, mm -hmm. insecticides. Right. So with, with orchards, Jaime is right. It's, it's not as much of an issue because your crop has already finished blooming and they're not going to be feeding until there's actually a crop there to feed on. So in theory, you should not have pollinators in your orchard. However, um, in vegetable settings and um, with certain cane fruit, they will be blooming and fruiting at the same time. And when that's the case, you do indeed have to be careful and if you're bringing in pollinators, for example, if you're renting in boxes, you would want to remove them before treating. And the other thing that you do, of course, is treat at night when the pollinators are not active. Um, and of course, keeping things mowed so that your weeds are not in bloom will help you protect your pollinators. Great, thank you both. Um...